For decades, China was an obvious source for low-cost manufactured products. Cheaper labor, government investments, and well-honed logistics resulted in a manufacturing powerhouse. COVID lockdowns, however, shipping bottlenecks, trade tensions, and other risks have dramatically changed the calculations for many manufacturing companies. Welcome to Global Sourcing Insights from SIPS. Today, we'll hear the reshoring stories of two small companies that manufacture recreation equipment. One of them builds electric bikes, the other towable inflatables. Their output may be barely a blip in the U.S. GDP, but their experiences have powerful lessons for companies of just about any size. So let's start with some introductions. First, Justin Cosmetis is founder and CEO of Vela Bikes, and they are manufacturers of innovative electric bicycles. Well, welcome, uh, Justin. Brian Fournier runs operations for WOW Sports, that's manufacturers of inflatable recreation equipment. Glad to have you here, Brian. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me, Bob. Excellent. And Dr. Christopher Rothline is a professor of management at Bryant University. Welcome, Christopher. Thank you very much for having me, Bob. And Dr. Rob Hanfield is a distinguished professor in the Supply Chain Management Department of North Carolina State University. He's also a regular guest of Global Sourcing Insights. So welcome back, Rob. Thanks, Bob. Pleasure to be here. Excellent. So Justin, let's start with you. How did your company get to China in the first place? If I recall correctly, you have your roots in Brazil where the bicycle uh, invention or the bicycle was invented, your innovative design. Correct. So we have been producing in South America since uh, 2012. Um, we were one of the first electric bikes in South America. Uh, my partner is based in Brazil, and we still have our production line in Brazil. Uh, Brazil has some heavy tariffs for importing um, Chinese bicycles into the market. And so we had to design originally a uh, local production option in Brazil. Uh, when we expanded into the United States, it was our desire to produce locally here in the United States, but there were no, almost no options available at the time, um, especially in 2019 going into 2020 with the bike boom of COVID. Uh, so we had to produce in China. Um, about 54% of the current e-bike market produces in China, another 27% in uh, Taiwan. So you're looking at about 75% of the market in those two, uh, in those two regions. Um, and so that's why we, we kind of went with the easiest option on the table, but it was by far, uh, not the easiest when you started looking at a bigger picture and thus why we immediately, uh, were looking at local options for our production. Okay. So, what were the trigger events or data points that got you thinking about moving production to the United States and out of China? Yeah, a long list um, and in no, uh, no particular order. Um, uh, COVID lockdown in China, shutting down our production, um, shipping delays, both under supply and over supply and inability to have clear insight in terms of our supply chain. Um, tariffs, the 301 exemption for e-bikes were, they were on, then they were off and then they were on and then they were off and literally, um, four times in, in the span of, of a two and a half year period. Um, personally from a keeping my own engineer team here in the United States and in Brazil up in the middle of the night to work with the local team inability to travel during COVID, um, and then I would say some of the bigger ones, quality and the ability to, to really have true oversight and, and, the, and control over our quality inspection and quality control for our product um, led to a lot of costly um, uh, situations where we had to do rework, we had to do warranty work, we had to do all sorts of stuff once the product got to the United States. Um, so those were the big, I, I think that's the short list. I could keep going. Sure. Okay. Well, we'll we'll circle back to that, but let's. Just, I'd like to hear a little bit uh, from Brian. So, uh, Brian, I have bounced around behind a boat hanging on top of an inflatable, a fancy inner tube, as I call it, and that's kind of what you build, isn't it? Yeah, that's exactly what we build. That's uh, a <laughs> that's the core of the business. 
Um, and, you know, similar to what Justin had described, you know, we, we had our roots in um, first production done in Taiwan, and then those folks moved over towards China. And then through, um, you know, competitors coming on board and through attrition through some of these suppliers, we met more and more suppliers, um, all based in China. So our supply chain um, was primarily or is primarily uh, from China. Then uh, during COVID, many of the similar experiences to, to Justin again, you know, we, first of all, we're, we're kind of a newer brand, you know, Wow Sports is a newer brand started in about 2010. Um, and there was other brands in the market that had uh, bigger pieces of the market share. We've, we'd grown our popularity. And at the same time that COVID hit, you know, we saw a spike in demand and we saw uh, delays in uh, production. We saw delays in shipping. Uh, and then when the goods did get here, then we ended up with, uh, too much inventory. Then in the second year of COVID, we had overbuying happening at our dealers and our distributors. So we've had basically a three-year situation where, you know, due to some of the uh, constraints that were happening early on in COVID, you know, we're still feeling some of the repercussions of those now with still excess inventory within the pipeline, the commercial pipeline uh, from our warehouse all the way through uh, small dealers. Um, and, you know, is an impact to that is, is high storage costs. We're facing high storage costs. And we realized at that point in time that because of the long lead times overseas, we were vulnerable, right? We weren't able to get product as quickly as we wanted to. We also had, uh, you know, quality challenges throughout that process. And we needed to figure out an alternative to being sole sourced in China, because should another pandemic hit or something else like that hit, we don't want to be caught in the same situation where we're unable to get inventory when things like local lockdowns really create a, a, an increase in demand for the products that, that, that we're using or that we're manufacturing and that folks are using. So when people are buying boats, people are using the products that go along with boats. People are installing swimming pools and products that go along with that. So we don't want to be caught in the future with a similar situation where we're unable to get product that our consumers and customers yeah. want. Yeah, when the market is there, you want to take advantage of it. Sure. So what was the challenge for you, Brian, in trying to, because you had you you didn't really have manufacturing uh, ability at all in the United States or anywhere outside of China. So what was the challenge to you and why did you turn to Chris at Bryant University? Sure. So, um, you know, I worked with Chris in the past on similar sorts of uh, supply chain related projects, um, you know, and re- uh, had this issue, wanted to re-engage uh, him for just networking purposes, really. And he said, hey, I got a group of students here that would be love, you know, would love to be working on a project like this for you. So I was explaining some of the challenges. Um, and, you know, at that point in time, we had already um, started to do some exploration into Mexico um, and some of the challenges along with that. We had a manufacturing partner that was willing to provide uh, equipment and manufacturing know-how if we were able to source some of the raw materials, um, you know, the raw PVC sheet, some of the nylon, some of the other components, because um, if, you, if you're going to import those from China to Mexico, you have another uh, conundrum with their, um, their sort of importing processes and procedures. So we ended up with like, hey, if we're going to do this and we're going to do it close to home, we probably should be looking within, within the U.S. So that's when I uh, engaged uh, Chris, wrote up a project brief and um, had a, a team of about six students um, tackle this from uh, the raw materials all the way through some of the uh, manufacturing processes to produce, um, you know, one of our products within the United States. Excellent. So, Chris, I'd like you to tell me, how did you and your students respond to this challenge? Well, the students, I introduced the projects, a couple projects to the students, and they petitioned for the project. So I put students on that have the right skill sets that could handle this in my words are exceed our clients expectations um, they first understood the project uh, what was needed brian gave them um, what i call scientific specifications um, things that they just couldn't buy any type of fabric or material they understood the importance of that and then they just went out and tried to find the suppliers in in the country say they, they looked all over they weren't limited to one certain area and then after um I think a pretty extensive uh, review and process of elimination. They came up with several um, possible suppliers that could work with Brian. And Brian had final approval in the end, but they worked um, long and hard. It's just 
a lot of it in with any with any job, um, especially in the beginning with supply chain management, it's it's grunt work, and they have to dig in. And we appreciate the opportunity to do that. And you know, the students took it. They 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 didn't complain, but they understood that it takes time. You have to roll up your sleeves and dig in and pay attention to details and be very yeah. thorough. So these these are pretty technical specifications because you can't just use any old plastic to make these uh, inflatables that are going to be sturdy enough to drag around behind a boat. So uh, Brian and Chris, how did that? How did they manage or handle uh, the the technical part of it? Because this is probably something that a a supply chain management student probably hadn't encountered in the past. Sure, we broke I it think down. Brian, yeah, well, you sorry. start, Brian. You go. Okay, yeah, we broke it down into the like five major components that that we would need, or capabilities that we would need. Um, you know, starting from the base PVC film all the way through the the welding and um, you know cutting and welding process, and then we separated out the cut and sew from that, and then we we took a separate look at packaging. So um, through that, they were able to identify specific suppliers, and we had created a a reach out like they had created a list of um, potentials. And then we went through and we uh, through a process of elimination, um, either through reach out or through just looking at their websites and understanding what their core competencies were, uh, eliminating them. Uh, and then we had a, a template email that was that would go out to uh, to these uh, potential manufacturers. When they responded, then I would jump in and um, provide more detail about what the project was, what we were looking to achieve, and um, you know ultimately uh, narrowed it down to a few that that weren't capable of making our um, different pieces of the product. And then ultimately, we would have to combine them together um, because there wasn't going to be one supplier that can do um, soup to nuts. We, we took a very modular approach to it. Uh, and that's how that's how I directed the students uh, during the project. And that you would recommend that as, a, as the process for anybody who's looking to reshore to really break it down into the into pieces. Don't expect to just take everything in one basket and bring it back to the United States. Uh, I mean, that's, that's my opinion. I, I don't, I don't know if that's exactly the right way to do it or not. I don't, I don't know if you're going to be able to just find for folks that make soup to nuts, what you're looking for. So if I think about back to how, you know, we, we might've started at the beginning, we were looking for cover suppliers and we were looking for, you know, the, the inner component suppliers, and then we were merging them together with one factory or the other, but there wasn't one that had the, the soup to nuts capability over time. They realized that that would be an efficiency. And as I'm talking about in China, they realized it'd be a, an efficiency to have, you know, all the way from, from PVC calendaring all the way through cut and sew. And, and we do have suppliers that can do that now, but that took time to develop. And, and that's not something that I think we're going to find just right out of the box here in the U.S. So we had to go back to that modular way of thinking. And then, you know, considering um, how we might combine these materials and pack them out into a consumer, a consumer facing retail packaging at the end of the line. Yeah. So uh, let's get back to Justin. Does this sound uh, familiar? What what, uh, what Brian went through? Is that kind of the process you had to kind of break things down? Or were you able to find uh, uh, the soup to nuts kind of supplier here in the United States? First and foremost, I'm, I'm jealous that he uh, had a nice team with Chris. I, I definitely want to connect and uh, see how we can work together. Um, Excellent. But, uh, but <laughs> but uh yeah that was it i mean our our bomb is is about 180 um separate component tree um many of which are just not accessible here in in the united states so for us it's it's importing a lot of those from from resources in europe throughout the asian um supply chain and then finding slowly starting to to work through the supply chain to see what is available here domestically um, we pick up a huge amount of efficiency when shipping our bike, even if you make no changes to, uh, the supply chain by shipping and doing final assembly here domestically. Um, and so for us, we created a model, um, back about a year and a half ago, we created a model as once we identified a couple, couple of local assembly options, um, for, uh, on shore and near shore too. We looked at Mexico as well. Um, and, uh, we broke down that model and it, it's kind of like the six stages of getting off the, the Chinese model, the Chinese production. Um, and we slowly started identifying what made the most sense. So for, for us at first, it was starting to, uh, work on the larger frames. And so once we got the frames domestically, 
um, then, you know, we could create a huge amount of efficiency locally with, with assembly and, and starting to ship that. And, but we're still working our way towards uh, more and more of our supply chain being domestic here. I think is one of these things that it's it would be hard to fully identify that um, domestically or even relying on Europe or, or some other markets for subcomponentry. Um, but it's really, you know, slowly starting to work towards that in, in a cost effective manner. I mean, some stuff, chains, you know, bike tires, some of these things will take longer for us to kind of ship things over. Um, but it was really finding that local partner in Detroit Bikes who's been producing uh, bikes for about 12 years in their facility and matching up with their assembly um, quite nicely and, and establishing that contract manufacturing uh, relationship at first. So Detroit Bikes, and um, I have to cheerlead for them because uh, I actually ride a Detroit bike, full disclosure. Um, I, I didn't know that. I didn't know that you had picked Detroit bikes when I first talked to you. So, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm saying that's a really good choice. I like it. Um, but, uh, so Detroit bikes is building the frames and they're also doing the final assembly. Is that what I'm getting? Correct. Yeah. It was, we first tested it out for, um, for doing final, we first tested it out for QC and then we tested it out for final assembly. And then we started working towards frames, um, and painting. Um, and so it allowed us to be flexible along that from a de-risking and kind of shifting things slowly. I like to use the analogy of a dimmer switch uh, rather than a, you know, just one quick switch for us. Um, allowed us to kind of test and evaluate how well our model kind of met the reality of, of producing. Um, and yeah, it, it was solely you know, the work that Detroit bikes had established allowed us and the fact that our frames were very close in nature, the same steel frame, um, same painting, you know, a lot of that matched up. Unfortunately for a lot of brands that want to make the shift, it just doesn't exist that infrastructure here in the United States for them to shift yet. So what was your sort of aha moment as you were doing the investigation where you say, yeah, this can really, this can really work. Or are you still sort of, uh, you had to kind of pull the switch and make a decision, even though you weren't a hundred percent sure that the numbers were all going to line up because some of these, uh, some of the advantages of reshoring are not uh, directly financial. You know, you have, like you say, uh, meetings are more efficient. Uh, you don't have time zone issues so much. Uh, the turnaround time between uh, design and build or, ch or uh, fixing changes or making changes in the design, that kind of thing. So what was your, did you have an aha moment where you said, this is really going to work? Or are you still working through that process, making it work? I'd like to hear both. You know, both it was something, you, Brian, Justin. Yeah, go ahead, Justin. Yeah, it was something that Brian Brian mentioned earlier that really um, it was the cash flow conversion for us and for me. And my background's in banking before I got into into biking, and for me, it was the efficiency of capital um, and shortening that production window, um, and then life cycle cost. So those two things: cash flow conversion on the production cycle and shortening production and the life cycle cost. Because when I started factoring in all these other things like additional work of, of QC and product once it got here to the United States, reworking all, all sorts of those pieces of the puzzle, it actually ended up being a lot cheaper for us to make the shift and make the move. And then for a small company, you know, cash is, is crucial for us to stay alive and for us to you know, be more efficient and have shorter production windows and not get oversupplied or undersupplied allows us to, you know, from a scale point of view, really, you know, it, it became a necessity, really. I, I, I like to say it's both, it was both a Hail Mary, but also the safest decision that, uh, that it made. And, um, you know, it paid off very quickly for us to make that shift. So you, you're beyond the proof of concept. You're actually, uh, it's starting to pay off. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We have the, we actually have, I mean, we're now a year into it and, and we have one of our last, um, we'll call it the legacy containers, legacy componentry, legacy tooling, legacy stuff leaving China actually this month, next month. 
Um, and, uh, and we're kind of like at the tail end of the, like this phase out, um, again, obviously still relying on a lot of subcomponentry wiring harnesses. Some stuff still makes sense for us to, I mean, again, our build is quite complicated. So it's some stuff will unfortunately, uh, remain in, in China and Taiwan and other, other options, but yeah, for the, for the overall, we're, we're at the tail end. Excellent. So, Brian, what was your aha moment, or are you still, are you not quite there yet? No, so because we're we're over inventoried, right? Um, you know, the, the the urgency on this is not not exactly um, you know you know top 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 of mind right now. Um, we are continuing to work on this, but we're actually not focused. We have a, another company too, another brand, and we're working on some of those. Uh, those types of items right now is in terms of our, you know, being forefront, top of mind, moving those products out of China, these novelty gifts, um, things like that uh, for our other brand. Um, but we will get back to uh, we will get back to towables, um, I'm sure, in the fairly near future. Um, and again, having having uh, the, the students have gone through some total cost of ownership calculations about, you know, what costs we would uh, what increased costs we would incur and which costs would go away or which costs would be, um, you know, significantly reduced. Um, you know, factoring all of that in, we do have a path to savings, um, even if, you know, some of our raw material costs even double. So um, this is where, you know, we, we want to put the model to the test and start really um, start really stepping on the gas on that probably within the next uh, 12 months. Were you surprised at when they when you started running numbers and looking at at efficiencies at uh, the, at the economics and that they really did favor the United States? Um, I actually was surprised, um, to be honest with you. Um, I didn't think it would be possible because um, part of part of uh, my uh, experience goes back to um, you know an experience where I was moving manufacturing from the U.S. to China. Right. And we very much started with that sort of like, let's start with the end, you know, started with the assembly process. And then we slowly built in all of the, the components and, and, you know, finding suppliers for those over in Asia. Um, and then when when looking at this uh, model and again, the challenge at that point was, hey, if you can save me X million dollars, then for sure we can keep it in the U.S. And it was just impossible at that time, just totally impossible. But the cost of labor then, you know, when we were we were first moving to China was, you know, 450 RMB a month. You know, now it's. 3,500, 4,000 RMB a month per worker. So, I mean, the, the the labor cost inputs have gone up dramatically in the past 15 to 20 years, and that really impacts it. And then you have, uh, you know, quality issues. I mean, just not being able to be there, you, you do have those quality issues that you need to stay on top of. So factoring those things in, plus the, the tariffs uh, that Justin mentioned, um, we have tariffs on our products, those would be avoided. Um, right now, shipping costs is not of a a big of a factor as it was uh, during COVID, but um, our products are fairly big. We can't fit a lot in a container. So the actual, um, you know, the landing cost for, for shipping a 40 foot over here uh, per item was quite high. Um, and, uh, you know, we realized some, again, vulnerability there with the, with our, uh, our shipping and freight costs. So, you know, those would be essentially removed. The amount of inventory that we would need to hold would be reduced. We wouldn't need to be on a line of credit at all. So, I mean, like all of these financial um, these financial benefits, when you add up all of the costs associated with them, they really, they really do put the total cost of ownership at a lower level than purchasing the straight product out of China and storing it because you have 180 day lead time. You know what I mean? Storing a lot of it because you have 180 day lead time. So these, these are the types of, um, you know, types of calculations that the students helped us work through and, and crank through. And, and really, I'm like, are, is this right? Like, let's double check this. Like, what if I double this price? Like, Am I still good? Yeah, we're still good. So, um, you know, like I said, the 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 um, the math is there. Um, you know, the model is there, uh, and we just need to take the next step here, which is really press on that model and um, you know vet it. Yeah. Okay, Rob Hanfield, you've been taking notes. You've been listening to this. Uh, are you cheering them on because they're riding a wave that's coming back to our shores, or? Are you squirming in your seat right now because uh, we're hearing from two companies that are the exception rather than the rule? So, uh, what do you think about uh, these two stories? No, I think this is this is a fascinating story, and uh, also congrats to your students, Chris. Uh, I know from personal experience how difficult and challenging it is to round up a group of students and get them to work, but when you get them going, they can really produce some uh, yes, incredible insights. Um, 
<clears throat> so, um, you know, my, my position is that, uh, yeah, I think I think China is is, you know, really taking a hit uh, as a result of, of zero covid. Um, we're seeing their economy just just tanking right now. Um, I think it wasn't just zero covid, but I think, uh, you know, China has also gotten a lot more expensive. So, you know, the labor arbitrage that was there uh, before for the previous 20 years, um, you know, that that business case just just isn't there, in fact. Uh, labor costs in Mexico uh, are uh, lower than they are in China right now. And certainly, you know, the freight from uh, the U.S. to Mexico is is a lot less than China. And you know, Mexico has got some great capabilities. Um, having said that, you know, there's also a number of things in China's favor that's not going to be able to uh, be easy manipulated. And I would say you know, it really, really does depend on the industry. It depends on uh, the economics as well of what's going on. Um, but one of the things that, you know, we we look at, and, and I have a new book uh, uh, right now called Flow, How the Best Supply Chains Thrive, uh, written with Tom Linton. And in that book, we cover uh, this very thing. How do we get our supply chains to flow again? How do we get material to move quickly? And, and I think that's that's the essence of what we're seeing here. And I love Justin's comment um, because uh, cash flow, cash flow is king, right? And, it, and if you've got something sitting on a, on a carrier uh, six six weeks in the in the Pacific Ocean, uh, and you know it gets to the gets to the port of Los Angeles, and you know there's a strike going on there, or you know there's there, it's a it's a slowdown. Uh, Gosh, you know that that's that's going to kill you if you're especially a small to medium sized enterprise. You can't you can't afford not to have cash flow, and and cash flow is is something that bigger companies are paying attention to now, and they're starting to see that, and they're also starting to see the the net effects of of visibility and also the ability to be more agile. Um, I, I'll bring you. I, I want to show a couple of examples. Uh, of companies that I've worked with recently and, and some of the, the the dynamics of the situation, because I, I can assure you it's not an easy, you know, black or white type of question. So, so one company I work with, um, uh, an automotive company, and uh, they source millions and millions of brake pads, right? Brake pads are obviously used in your vehicle. It's in a, you know, I, I can tell you they're a, uh, they're a, uh, auto parts supplier to the aftermarket. Well, uh, there are three major manufacturers of brake pads uh, that have 90% of the market, and the, all three of them are located in the same province in China. Now, you're, you're not gonna switch over to, you know, suddenly a new supplier that it's not gonna be competitive. They may probably don't have the technology. They don't have the expertise. And it's, it's just gonna be very, very difficult to switch and move out of China. Um, another organization, you know, in the electronic sector, um, you know, there, there's a reason why all of the electronics assembly is done in China. It's because China is exceptionally good at it. Um, and, and this is something else that people don't realize. Um, Chinese women have very small hands and they're really, really good. At assembly in in microelectronics, uh, you know we've got these big you know beat hooks over here. So, you know we're not, we're not we don't have that dexterity, and and they are just really good at executing in assembly in microelectronics, um, and and that's another factor, and that's why, you know, a long time ago Stephen Jobs told Obama, we are never going to be producing iPhones in the United States. <laughs> it just ain't gonna happen. And, and, you know, if they need to switch over to a new model, bam, they can do it. You know, Foxconn is, is able to do that. I will tell you, though, that there are other companies that are also starting to move over uh, and looking at, at a blend of offshoring and nearshoring. So, so one company, we, we did a study, again, a student uh, project study um, with, with a uh, apparel uh, manufacturer, and what they looked at is they looked at the total cost of ownership. Um, and so they looked at, you know, what is the cost of offshoring versus nearshoring? 
And the offshoring, the, you know, if you just looked at peace price, it was it was a, like a, a no brainer, right? It was it was way way lower. But then they started looking at some of the hidden costs of having those those uh, long term, uh, long lead time supply chains. You know, having weeks and months of, of lead time. And, and one is uh, seasonality. You know, it, it's it's difficult to hit that season. It's difficult to get, uh, you know, that that product on the shelf, uh, on, and and get it in time for that season. Uh, another one is uh, ordering the wrong stuff, right? So, you know, consumers are very fickle. So if you order, you know, a million uh, blue blue T-shirts, and then all of a sudden the latest color is purple or pink. Uh, you know, guess what? You've ordered the wrong stuff and, and you're stuck with all of this stuff that then gets uh, excess uh, inventory at the end of the season and you, and you sell at a loss. And all of a sudden that, you know, that low piece price doesn't look so great because you've got stuff that you've taken a hit on, on all of this. Uh, and the other one, of course, is, is uh, uh, you know, the, the, the actual transportation costs of, of shipping stuff. And that has gone down quite a bit. Um, but, you know, these are parameters and variables that are, are constantly shifting. And so what we're seeing is companies are starting to look at a blend. Maybe we do 80 percent offshore uh, and maybe 20 percent uh, nearshore because the nearshoring gives you that agility and flexibility to be able to react to things like consumer preferences or, you know, seasonal shifts in demand or, you know, suddenly this this the one product's taken off. You need more of it. Well, if you have a local supplier, you could probably get that done more quickly. Uh, maybe not your margin isn't as high, but you're able to, to respond to that market. So, so we have to look at all of these different parameters. And I think it's it's a complex decision. I don't think it's a black or white answer. Yeah. So, uh, Justin, Brian, uh, does that sound familiar? Sound like uh, applying to some of your cases? Uh, long lead, long lead times uh, were certainly an, an issue. And also, um, were you kind of pushed around uh, because you were a smaller customer? Uh, I'm thinking of Justin primarily. Uh, you weren't the the biggest customer of some of the. I mean, they build a lot of bikes in China. <laughs> they build a lot of bikes. So, were yeah. you having some issue because you weren't the biggest fish in the pond? For sure. Yeah, we actually got our one of our first factories that we started working with. We were a couple of weeks away from pressing go on our our production in China, um, and Walmart came in and actually bought up the capacity for almost two years and so we were back to square one after you know threw away four to six months worth of work and had to start all the way back from scratch and um you know what rob was saying on on um seasonality and consumer preference is is really really rings true in, in our world i mean 70 percent of bikes are sold between april and and um and september labor day and so it's you know, for us, you, if you miss that mark, you know, you, you miss most of the, the season and you need to wait, you know, for the next go around. And that's huge, especially when, like, when you look back at when the lockdowns were happening, when the tariffs were happening, when the shipping delays were happening, really, really impacted us and stifled a lot of our growth in the early years because of that. Um, but it's also, I mean, like, I, I have near... You know, I can react to the consumer right now, and especially now in the economic times of like, I can decide are we producing 40 bikes next month or 400 bikes? Um, and, you know, that is that is huge for us as we kind of wait out consumer preference and as, as things, you know, hopefully start recovering here later this year going into next year, that is is crucial. I mean, we, we have to cover the cost of the early componentry, but that's barely a third of our overall build costs. So it's for me, it's like, I'm willing to take that risk and have that and build that in and be strategic about that. Have to have a lot more clarity in terms of my supply chain and those smaller pieces coming into the mix. But it's like, it offers a huge benefit for me to be able to react. And I leave my frames unpainted. So back to Rob's, you know, preference, you know, the consumer preference, if people start prefer preferring yellow bikes over green bikes, 
I can make that change in a matter of weeks before going to the consumer or offer that as an additional, you know, value add. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it really is going to be crucial for us as we grow and, and scale up here. Fortunately, I wish, you know, more of, you know, we currently as a country only produce about 3% of the electric bikes and electric mobility here domestically. So we've got a long way to go and need a lot more of the overall industry. We need more facilities. We need more of the subcomponentry, more local for this to be more and more viable. But I think it will, I think, you know, the preference is continuing to shift and especially on the life cycle. I mean, for our good, for our particular um, use case, you know, an electric bike and a, a bike, you need that to factor in the life cycle costs and the, those replacement parts and the ability to fix and maintain your, your item for a consumer and for a brand is local. It, it, you know, benefits the, the overall industry tremendously to have that more on shore. Excellent. So, Brian, are you uh, looking for the same kind of uh, um, agility uh, to change things? Uh, yeah. How often do inflatables have new trends? I don't know. Is that well, part of part <laughs> yeah, of? Give me a little. Some, yeah, give me a rundown so, on that. Yeah, there are a couple couple things that uh, that Rob said uh, also ring true for our business. Our business is very seasonal. You know, from Memorial Day to Labor Day is kind of when we sell the majority of our products. Um, you know, we weren't getting pushed around by our suppliers too much, but they were asking for us to place commitments and place orders for that capacity much earlier than they typically would um, because their capacity was filling up. And that led us to make uh, decisions that were, um, you know, uh, uh, again, in hindsight, you know, uh, could have been better in two ways. Number one, the products that we selected um, and the quantity we selected, right? So having such a long lead time, you can't, can't react to those consumer changes as quickly as you would be able to if you had a shorter lead time and a much more flexible uh, production model. So, um, you know, those those two things really, um, really drove, um, again, drove home the, the need for us to uh, to come up with al alternatives to what we're currently doing. Excellent. So, uh, Chris Rothline, go ahead, jump in here. What do you think? Well, what I'm thinking is we take on about we work with about 10 different companies a year in our supply chain program. And what I'm seeing in the last few years, more and more companies are asking for this kind of work. They they seem to be switching. They're bringing their products back to the United States. So I'm seeing probably about 10% of the projects we work on are companies that saying, we want to look at the total cost of ownership. We want to bring products back to the United States. Does it make sense for us? And, you know, we're more than happy to do those projects. And our students love it. They love the idea. They, they take a lot of pride in bringing business back to the United States. And, and you know, I, I think the misconception of supply chain management in the beginning was it's all about saving money. It's all about cost and just cost is the driver. And they're finding out through these projects that it's much more than that. It's about value added suppliers and long term commitments and, you know, long term success for everyone in the supply chain. So I think what both um Brian Justin is saying here it's it's reflective in what the student projects are doing and I think it's it's a trend that's only getting stronger. Excellent. So we have a question here from Tony. Uh, let's see if we can get through this. Lots of benefits for making it close to market. Uh, time to market, uh, feedback loops are tighter, etc. But uh, he's interested in the impact to the, to the delivered cost and whether that was a margin hit. Or was there an ability to pass on, uh, pass it on to the consumer? So, Justin, were you really? Did you have to raise prices? Did you get get hit by the margin? You know, when you're making these total cost of ownership or total cost of uh, total costs, uh, where does your margin? Where did that play into the picture? Yeah, um, we passed off a slightly higher cost um, to the to the consumer um, again back to kind of the life life cycle cost but in doing so like we passed off a higher cost but we also passed off a lifetime warranty on our frames so um, and brought it much more part of the conversation of the bike and and the you know better quality and more QC and we also introduced a buyback program with our with our goods at the same time because we had the infrastructure to be able to handle um, this kind of upcycling um, 
and uh but we definitely passed off a little bit of that cost um didn't fa- and but i think as we as we scale um and as we i'm actually on a mission to bring more bike com- companies and not just electric bikes but electric scooters electric snowmobiles everything into this facility um so as we bring more in there and we see the economies of scale of more um, brands producing in that facility, I think we'll lower the overall cost and actually be able to reduce that cost um, going into even next year. Um, so uh, it wasn't as big of a, as an impact as, as we initially kind of thought or, or buffered in our, in our projections. So yeah. Brian, why don't, you, why don't you, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, the other thing I was going to say is, you know, I, I think there's also increasing consumer appetite for, um, you know, domestically produced mm-hmm. goods like like Detroit bikes, you know, made in America. And uh, there's there's, you know, if you haven't picked it up, there's distinct anti-China sentiment right now these days. <laughs> and uh, whether you like it or not, uh, but but you know, there's there's also strong support for. Uh, you know, domestically produced goods. And um, I, I think that's a, you know, a big check in your column, Justin, that that uh, consumers are very aware of that as well and, and uh, are, are willing to pay a little bit more if it's produced in the U.S., for sure. So, yeah, I, uh, yeah go ahead, Justin. I was going to say, uh, it was me, um, but uh, based sorry. on, yeah, based on the way that the, uh, that our P&L is structured, um, it would be a, a slight hit to our, our gross margin level. Um, but overall, we would get to pick up on the the reduced inventory, the uh, the financing costs, and things like that. So at the the expense line, at the net margin line, we would be the same or a bit ahead versus where we are now. So I guess to answer your question, I, I think it probably depends a little bit about how your P and L is structured. Because if you're just talking about um, you know piece part prices, um, for sure you're going to see some sort of margin hit. But depending on what you what you're putting into the the uh, cost of goods sold, um, you may or may not see an impact depending on how your again how your P and L is structured. I, so I, yeah, I can also, so you really have to you, go ahead. Go ahead, Rob. Yeah, I was going to I was going to share another another example. You know, um, one of the other things that you don't often see is, you know, when you have people producing your stuff on the other side of the world, um, there's not very good communication with them. They're in a different time zone. Some you know, in China, there's a different language. Very few people speak English, and and you just don't get that level of of communication and feedback. Uh, that you do. And, you know, Japanese uh, auto manufacturers, Honda and Toyota, have always uh, gone by the mantra of you buy where you sell and sell where you buy. And they, wherever they sell, they develop local suppliers and local production um, because they insist on having that that relationship, you know, having that that Kanban signal, having that um, that immediate feedback. And I think that's where uh, you know, during COVID, everyone, uh, JIT got a, just in time, got a really bad rap because everyone would say, well, they, they all had zero inventory. They were just in time. No, just in time is about having domestic local suppliers and, and having them nearby where you can communicate and where you can increase that inventory. You can have daily deliveries. You can have working sessions. So, uh, you know, that's that's what real just in time is about is, is having a domestic supply base. Yep. So, uh, Brian, you're also you're still heavily in China. Um, so tell us about that. You're you're in that uh, that sort of the the never never land that I think Rob uh, mentioned, where you have to look at individual pieces and parts of it. And so, how do you stay? You want to be agile at the same time. You there are certain things that, frankly, they're just really good at it in China, and so you're not going to get away from that. So we're we're kind of where are you in that? uh in in that geography um so i would say that yeah our suppliers are really good at what um what they do and and being able to produce for us from end to end uh however one of the you know one of the the major questions and missions that we had when when we were over there just a couple weeks ago was to uh have uh, discussions with them about their plans um, you know, the specific Chinese manufacturers plans to uh, move outside of the country or have manufacturing um, redundant manufacturing capabilities outside of the country, because that's also, um, I think, a frequent request of uh, U.S. companies of these Chinese manufacturers as to what, you know, 
what are what are the plans to move outside of of China? Um, so I think that you know there is a you know maybe not just a, a reshoring to the U.S. Uh, momentum afoot, um, but you also have this diversification outside of China, whether it be in Indo Indonesia, Vietnam, Cambodia, Philippines, where, wherever it might be. Um, there is a um, uh, say a leveling of the uh, playing field or a reshuffling of the deck in terms of like the manufacturing uh, capacity and capability of of Southeast Asia. So um, I don't know if I've answered your question or not, but that's <laughs> that's kind of yeah. how I see us uh, playing playing you know playing with these particular folks um, at this point in time. Excellent. So actually, I'd like to circle back, Rob, to to the brake pads. Uh, put a put a brakes put some brakes on the conversation here. Uh, it seems to me that there's two things. One, uh, you know, we can afford to probably brake pad uh, design changes don't happen all that frequently, and they're sort of a uh, not a really high high value item. So, and they're small. So you probably can afford to have sort of just in case uh, rather than just in time inventories. You can stack a lot of brake pads, and so you can reduce your your. Uh, so it makes sense to go to a lower cost supplier, a uh, lower direct cost. Uh, some of these other issues about communications and supply chains are not really as relevant if you if it's a small part and it's not a real high value. But on the other hand, you said that they're all made in the same province. I mean, isn't that really that's that's a scary thing for anybody who went through the tsunami in Japan and found that their supply chains were just ravaged because uh, there were so many pinch points where we all thought we had different suppliers, but all the suppliers were in the same region and they all got hit by the same storm. So how do you play that? Uh, where, where does that where does the brake pads fit into the bigger picture? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean that that's that's a huge um huge risk. Um I've heard all kinds of stories like that, you know, where Apple had um you know two disk drive suppliers um both in the Philippines uh less than a mile from an active volcano, right? So you hear crazy stories like that. But um you're right. I mean it's a big risk, but but you know that that happens to be that manufacturing area uh where you know, there's there's a lot of automotive manufacturing and component manufacturing going on, and that tends to be the case in China. You get sort of these regionalized uh, levels of of specialization uh, going on there, um, and there's just not a lot you can do about that. Um, you know, I, I will say that um, you know there's there's attempts to try to move a lot more stuff, as I said, to Mexico. And, and there's a lot of benefits to, to sourcing in Mexico as well, um, you know, for those, you know, kind of higher volume, lower cost uh, kinds of kinds of elements. And one is, you know, uh, uh, with the free trade agreement, you know, you're, you're, you're not really paying uh, any tariffs uh, on, on those goods. Number two, you know, it's, it's you know, uh, one day away. So you can, you can get a, a trailer or container there and back, uh, you know, very quickly. Uh, so, and I, I, I talk to companies who do just that. They, they have a trailer go down to Juarez. Uh, they get two or three trailers coming, going back and forth every day uh, and, and getting regular shipments. So, so you get that, that regular features. And another thing is, you know, they're nearby. So you can, you can be there on a plane in a day and the communication is pretty good. You know, Spanish and English are, are, are spoken a lot down there. So obviously, so that's, uh, uh, that's a benefit. And, um, you know, I've, I've been to some of those automotive factories uh, down in Saltillo, Mexico. They are just exceptionally efficient. And, um, you know, the, you, you go into these, some of these factories and it's, it's all women and they've got like a daycare so they can bring their kids when they go to work at the factory. So it's, it's a great setup. It's very efficient. And, uh, you know, the one thing they have against them, of course, is the cartels. And so I think if they can get control of that, um, you know, we have we have sort of a natural, you know, Pan American uh, supply chain potentially here, because you've got Mexico with the lower cost labor, Canada with the lower cost resources, and of course the U.S. with with lots of capital. So you know, there's there's potential here for more of this regionalization of supply chains to occur. Excellent. 
Do you think there there has been two significant pieces of reshoring legislation and uh, trying to incentivize uh, carrot and stick approaches, I think. So is it going to take some continuous government support to maintain momentum in reshoring? What do you think, Rob? Well, I, I think you're talking about, you know, the CHIPS Act, right? Which is, which yes. is one. Um, and, you know, the CHIPS Act um, is, uh, it's, it's a, you know, it's a good start, um, but it's sort of a drop in the bucket, if you will, <laughs> you know. Semiconductors are extremely complex to manufacture. There's 600 steps. You know, we've mapped out their supply chain. They have you know, tens of thousands of suppliers that, that produce uh, components into a chip plant and services. Uh, so, you know, building a fab in Columbus, you know, is, is like a drop in the bucket. There's also a lot of uh, hooks that comes with that funding. So uh, I've heard of companies that aren't really happy about, you know, some of the some of the requirements that, that are there as well. Um, it, you know, semiconductors, we're not going to build a semiconductor industry in the U.S. overnight. It's, it's going to take a lot of time. It's going to take decades. So uh, I, I don't think it's something that happens all that quickly. Excellent. So, Chris, go, uh, why don't you weigh in here based on what you're seeing and hearing? What do you think it'll take to keep America in the forefront as a manufacturing country? What are you telling your students about uh, hope for manufacturing jobs here in the USA? Well, this, this last point you just mentioned, I, I tell the students that the United States is behind. Other countries invest a lot more in their manufacturing. There's a lot more state-sponsored projects or country-sponsored projects um as as a strategic initiative from a country and we're just starting to realize that we should be doing that too you know we've always felt the strongest survive and capitalism is what rules in this country but in other countries sure that works but there's sponsored dollars and initiatives to help make things happen and i think we need to do the chip sack i think is is a is a nice start but i think we can be doing much more and we should be doing much more um, excellent Good. So uh, in a couple of minutes that we have left here, Justin, uh, why don't you tell us what are one or two lessons learned that you have learned that you might share with others that might be in similar circumstances? What are the one or two things that you think we ought to have in top of mind uh, if we're thinking about doing a reshoring project? Um, I think one of the big things is in, in kind of like talking and you know, around this point a little bit, but it needs to be a sense of like, you know, kind of community coming together, at least in the micro mobility, electric bike, electric scooter, you know, all of this, like the community starting and the industry is starting to like, look at this together and look at the life cycle costs and looking at, you know, the bigger picture here. But I think there really needs to be more conversations and more kind of pulling together of resources and, and abilities and investments. And I think that you know, I think it's becoming more and more part of the conversation, um, but it needs to, you know, we need to come together and, and find solutions here. I mean, we're definitely just tip of the iceberg of starting to make this shift. And, um, and but it really, you know, I think working together is, um, is, uh, is crucial for it to, uh, to be successful. Excellent. Brian? Yeah. Uh, what do you think? Things. What's your yeah. top lesson? So t two things, get started, <laughs> get going. Like, like you, you can't wait around for this to, to, you know, by the time that it's a, it's urgent and important, it's going to be too late. So get started on it, you know, a ASAP. Um, and the second thing is build, you know, build your network and keep, keep talking to people. I think that, you know, this, this whole sense of uh, community or this whole sense of like just talking with others about, you know, what you're working on and who, you know, and, you know, striking up a conversation, I think is going to be really important to, um, you know, understanding what's out there and, and what opportunities there are. It's not like you can just go onto the site and type in, I'm looking for, you know, X, Y, and Z component and be able to get it. You, you have to start somewhere. And I think it starts with those small conversations within your, your own personal networks. Very good. Rob, you want to wrap things up with your final thoughts here? What are you thinking? Yeah. What's so, the big takeaway? Yeah, this, yeah. this has been a really interesting discussion and, um, yeah, I, I don't think there's any, you know, right and wrong answers here. As, as I've said, uh, I think you have to look at the economics. You have to look at uh, consumer demand. You have to look at lead times. Um, you know, you also have to think about 
um, maybe a blend of, of, of this. You know, I, I talked to one guy in the power tools industry and, you know, his boss told him, we're going to move everything here. And he goes, are, are you kidding me? There, you know, that, that's never going to happen. We're, you know, how we're going to compete, you know, <laughs> we just, you, you, competition is, is really, really critical. And, you know, while cost is, uh, is, is really important, you got to look beyond piece price. You have to look at, uh, you know, landed costs. You got to look at quality. You got to look at delivery. You got to look at flexibility and agility. So there's a, there's a lot of factors to look at uh, in when you're looking at this decision. Well, it's a big choice. And I know, uh, uh, I think we've recently heard that uh, Black & Decker just quit a highly publicized effort to make craftsman hand tools in uh, in Texas. They were relying on a highly automated process, but apparently the robotics weren't doing the job, uh, among other factors. So uh, it isn't something that you just have to, you, you can't just jump right in. You have to be really uh, paying attention and seeing where, where the opportunities really are and not doing something just for a PR effort or a, or a, a wing and a prayer, as it were. So excellent. Mm -hmm. Well, listen, thank you very much, everyone, for participating here. Uh, and uh, our participants, you can watch the SIPS uh, homepage or your our YouTube channel for the recording later if you want to share it with colleagues. So um, have a great day. This has been Global Sourcing Insights from SIPS. I'm Bob Rosbeck. Take care.